Einen schönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zu unserer großen Ernst-Lubitsch-Reihe Lecture and Film in Kooperation mit der Goethe-Universität. Das ist ganz großartig, dass wir da immer so viel Zeit mit verbringen können mit diesen Themen. Und gerade Ernst-Lubitsch, wir haben ja schon viel erfahren, dass er in Deutschland gar nicht so wahrgenommen wurde, wie er es eigentlich verdient hätte. Und das werden wir heute ändern mit einem amerikanischen Abend, so kann man ihn nennen. Denn ein früher amerikanischer Stummfilm mit einem Gast aus den USA und der Filmkopie sogar auch aus den USA. Denn wir werden The Marriage Circle gleich in einer 35mm Kopie aus dem Museum of Modern Arts im MoMA in New York sehen. Also das ist somit das weitestmögliche, was wir machen können. Ich da so, da hatte ich jetzt nicht bezweckt, aber freut mich natürlich, dass Sie klatschen. Genau. Ja, diese Reihe... Ähm, dass äh, wir versuchen wirklich auch Filme zu zeigen, die eher selten sind. Unser Pianist zum Beispiel kannte den jetzt auch noch nicht. Ich werde ihn nachher dann auch vorstellen. Ähm, das äh, wird eine ganz spannende Geschichte werden, glaube ich, wie man diesen Film, der, den Chaplin, Hitchcock und Kurosawa als ihren Lieblingslubitsch bezeichnen, dann erleben werden. Ja, ich möchte gar nicht so viel Vorrede machen. Sie wissen, wir haben auch immer ein Begleitprogramm und das ist in diesem Monat dem nächsten Vortrag quasi angeschlossen, wo wir Ich möchte kein Mann sein unter anderem sehen werden. Also das Thema Crossdressing in der deutschen oder internationalen Filmkomödie. Und da haben wir zum Beispiel Charlies Tante jetzt demnächst hier auf dem Programm mit Heinz Rühmann, Gustav Adolfs Page mit Lieselotte Pulver in Männernkleidern, aber natürlich auch Billy Wilders Some Like It Hot der mit Lubitsch ja auch selbst zusammengearbeitet hat, mehrfach und sein Drehbuchautor war. Ähm, weil das heute auch anklingen wird, möchte ich schon mal vorausschicken. Wir haben eine ergänzende Lecture noch ausgemacht, das weiß zum Beispiel Marc und Rembert auch noch gar nicht. Am 8. Juli, Samstag, werden wir anlässlich des 100. Jubiläums von Das Fidele Gefängnis ähm, diesen Film zeigen aus dem Jahr 1917 und der wurde im Deutschen Filmarchiv, also von zwei Kollegen von mir, restauriert und das wird zum ersten Mal eine farbkolorierte Fassung geben. Das ist sehr, sehr besonders und das werden wir dann am Samstag, den 8. Juli um 18 Uhr hier tun und dann auch mit Musik Begleitung kann ich Ihnen schon mal sehr ans Herz legen. Aber jetzt genug der Vorrede. Ich übergebe an Marc Siegel, der ins Englische spricht, äh, ins switcht und danke auch nochmal dem Exzellenzcluster ähm, Normative Orders, dass das alles hier so möglich ist. Schönen Abend. Ja, ich switche. One of the pleasures of co-organizing a series like this one is that it provides an opportunity to invite scholars whose work you have admired from afar, but who you have not had the opportunity of meeting personally. Um, it's purely a social occasion. Um, and who you have not heard speak publicly. Such is the case with Jennifer Bean, whose substantial research and scholarship in the area of silent cinema has long interested me. I think it was the impressive 600-page book with a fabulous silver screen-like cover, A Feminist Reader in Early Cinema, that she co-edited for Duke University Press in 2002, which first alerted me to her foundational work in this area. But as I looked further, I found numerous fine essays on various issues related to early cinema, including female stars, technology, the body, and space. She has been at the forefront of thinking through the historiography of early cinema, and as part of this project has edited two other important collections, Flickers of Desire, movie stars of the 1910s from 2011, and Silent Cinema and the Politics of Space, 2014. A new book, The Play in the Machine, Gender, Genre, and the Cinema of Modernity, a monograph, a single authored work, is forthcoming from Duke University Press. Jennifer Bean is an associate chair of comparative literature, cinema, and media, and director of cinema and media studies at the University of Washington in Seattle. In addition to her day job, she is also highly active in silent era film preservation and restoration and has served as advisor to numerous 
organizations and companies, including the Women and Film History International Project, the Tannhauser Film Company Preservation Incorporated, on which she serves, um, on whose board she serves, as I understand it, Turner Classic Movies, the British Film Institute, the UCLA Film and Television Archive, and the National Film Preservation Foundation. So some of the most important um, film preservation institutes um, in the world, one could say. Not just as an American that we claim the world, um, but uh, Britain was, in, oh, whoops, that's, they. <laughs> okay, well, and we've initiated um, uh, at dinner um, that she will work with the film museum here um, on helping to initiate a Lubitsch restoration project, correct? Yes. Okay. Ah. There's seven people who are interested. <laughs> As we discuss the details for tonight, Jennifer asked about the size of the cinema at the film museum because she's used to presenting silent films for audiences of 3,000 at the historic 1928 Paramount Theater in Seattle. I told her it only seats 133, but that it's a highly engaged and pleasant group. Thus far, her scholarship has not focused specifically on Lubitsch, and so Rembert Hooser and I were thrilled that she was willing to take on this opportunity to apply her substantial skills in film history, theory, and analysis, specifically to Lubitsch's work. And um, she revealed her um, uh, distinction with the choice of this film, I think. Uh, a very rarely screened film, as we hear, have heard, but also a very um, under-attended to film in Lubitsch scholarship, The Marriage Circle. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Bean. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, and I have to say, at the Paramount, ah, yeah, I project. At the Paramount Theater in Seattle, it does seat 3,000 and, and people do come. But size truly doesn't matter. Uh, it's all about the quality. Um, I, I, I begin. Uh, with this title, I um, mean, it's a title that I believe might be printed in a program or that might have has been circulating on the web. And I wanted to leave it here, but I want you to also know that the title has changed. However, in a move that I would like to imagine is Lubitsch-esque, in, in, the, in the way in which he edits with a certain kind of elliptical way in which what you think you are about to see or what is about to be revealed through that door or on the other side of that object is hidden from you and then suddenly it's there. Uh, that's a move I want to perform in my talk. Uh, and as I told everyone at dinner, I always attempt to imitate either actors or directors and it's a failure, uh, but it's an attempt. Um, now, this original title, though, I should explain, is, is, is a certain kind of innuendo. Um, it comes from Joseph von Sternberg's autobiography, um, in which he looks back at the marriage circle, and he writes this of Lubitsch, and I quote, In the marriage circle and other works, this famous director contrived a kind of innuendo that became known as the Lubitsch touch. The basic theory behind this often amusing, amusing contrivance was that no matter what happened, one would always have a twinkle in the eye and never lose his sang-froid, end quote. Now, I do want to retain that sense of the twinkle in the eye and the composure that comes with the sang-froid, uh, but I will not speak again of the Lubitsch touch. I want, to Im uh, I want to introduce another term today, and that will come. Um, as I was uh, working on the talk, and I've lost my, oh, there it is, my clipper. Um, there were a number of, of pieces that came to my attention. And I had also thought that I would begin today by uh, really foregrounding the way in which uh, the United States was courting and luring Lubitsch um, in 1922. He came to the uh, US largely to promote his film, The Loves of Pharaoh. Um, and you have, this is actually a piece from Luella Parsons, a well-known columnist at the time, who went on at length about her, her interview with him. He spoke very rapid German, she said, and she called in an interpreter. Um, her 
uh, lavish, lavish praise of him, um, as well as the way that you see with The Marriage Circle, his second U.S. film, uh, following Rosita, uh, which was a Mary Pickford v vehicle, and and Mary Pickford very much wanted to change her star image, so she really got Lubitsch to come to work with her, um, and that's an important film. Uh, they didn't get along. Uh, I really think that Marriage Circle is where um, a certain kind of modern Hollywood begins, and I think that's been entirely overlooked in scholarship, and it's a part of what I want to get to today to to have us begin to to rethink uh, this period of cinema that stretches through Lubitsch's career uh, by taking as its starting point the marriage circle. Now, rather than linger on the uh, kind of uh, text surrounding um, his arrival and this kind of thinking of Lubitsch was brought over, he was a star. Um, it's his name uh, in the marriage circle that's being promoted. Uh, I was thinking about this and then I came across a most interesting phenomena. In the United States, that is two years ago in 2015, The New Yorker uh, took upon itself to have as the movie of the week, The Marriage Circle. Now the reason uh, was because as Richard Block, who writes this piece uh, for the magazine and the online web, um, which it appears, uh, put, as he put it in, and I quote, um, that there was a splendid controversy that arose in 1981 over the director Ernst Lubitsch and his second Hollywood feature, The Marriage Circle, which was filmed in 1923 and released the following year. The controversy, he tells us, was sparked by Dwight MacDonald's assertion in an article in the New York Review of Books that Lubitsch made The Marriage Circle as a facsimile of Charlie Chaplin's 1923 romantic drama, A Woman of Paris. Now, let's face it, Lubitsch and Chaplin have much in common. Um, they were great friends. They admired, I believe Urs mentioned at the outset that Chaplin looked to The Marriage Circle as one of his favorite films. And it's true, Lubitsch uh, spoke of in his autobiography that, uh, that The uh, Woman of Paris uh, was an inspiration to him. You could even look back at Lubitsch's acting career in Berlin in the, in the mid-1910s. I believe you've seen some of that, those of you who've been coming to this series. Uh, he's been likened to Chaplin uh, in his acting style at that period. Later, you can flash forward. You can't think about what it means for Lubitsch to take on in To Be or Not To Be in 1942, a film that is a satire, a spoof of uh, uh, Hitler's invasion of Poland without thinking about Chaplin's The Great Dictator and, and his spoof of Hitler in 1940. That said, it's ridiculous uh, to think that this is a, a facsimile, uh, but it gives journalists something to write about. Um, it also gives me something, uh, a little bit of something to share with you by way of beginning, uh, because the New Yorker put together a montage uh, and a voiceover of the marriage circle that I want to share with you uh, as a kind of way of introducing the film, um, some perspectives on it, and it will be one of the predominant kind of set of images from the marriage circle that I'll, I will share with you uh, tonight. So let me, with that said, uh, clip, uh, please. As the New Yorker's montage, um, I think, explains in a variety of ways, the theme of a very modern form of infidelity um, and a particularly a certain type of licentiousness or sexual promiscuity on the part of the woman, um, that may be the one element that Lubitsch's film shares with Chaplin's A Woman of Paris. Uh, it is certainly not enough uh, to refer to uh, the one as a facsimile of the other. And in fact, Richard Block, the um, author of the piece, Movie of the Week, per posted that uh, indeed to uh, defame McDonald's claim. Now you'll see, this is a, a two posters of the marriage circle from the time of its release that will uh, serve as sort of stoppers along the way um, through our images in the talk. Um, and very clearly, uh, as you see in the promotion for the film, uh, we have a Marie Provost, a Provost character um, with the key to the situation as she gives the key to Franz Braun, Charlotte's husband, um, that the, the woman's, uh, this kind of, again, I'll call it modern form of infidelity being heightened and promoted, um, said again, again here a scene that's in the opening of the film um, as Marie Provost's uh, character Mitzi uh, flirts uh, with the man that she has just met. Now, 
not a facsimile of Chaplin, but without a doubt, Lubitsch is drawing from a 19th century tradition um, of a series of plays that could be termed facsimiles of facsimiles in the sense that when we talk about the tradition of theatrical farce, it's very difficult to determine where there is an origin, uh, particularly if we follow Ben Brewster's detailed account. And he writes, and I quote, the repetitive and cyclical character of the farce plot is notorious. It is a prime example of the mechanical character of the genre that has led to its contemptuous dismissal by much theatrical and literary criticism, end quote. For Brewster, Bernard Shaw's condemnation of the pink dominoes as wearisome, as a plot endlessly reiterated and predictable, as surface rather than substance, makes sense in part since Les Domino Rose, the 1876 play by Hennequin and Delacour, started a quarter century vogue for full length farce on the English stage. Initially, these plays were translations or adaptations of French originals, but by the 1880s, English playwrights, just such as Charles Hawtrey uh, and Brandon Thomas, were inventing native versions. But the stereotypical plot remains, hewing closely to the lines of their French forebears. What might seem surprising, given the different moral sensibility usually assumed between Victorian England, England and uh, France of la belle époque, is the crucial role of adultery, either actual or threatened, in the plots of so many of these plays. Equally surprising is the success of the same plays in New York and in the United States. Dion Bucicot's Forbidden Fruit, a remoter derivative of Les Domino Rose, but one which preserves this, the theme of an adulterous spree, had already been produced in New York in 1876 before Aubrey's version was given in London. Now, of particular interest uh, to us tonight is Le Réveillon. Uh, it was first staged in Paris on September 10, 1872, uh, and it predates Les Domino Rose by four years. Um, noticeably, Le Réveillon was adapted to English as On Bail uh, by W.S. Gilbert, uh, and it, on February 12, 1877, it premiered a month before the opening night of the Pink Dominoes. Now, both of these uh, pieces played in the same theater with the same principal actor, Charles Wyndham. Both share a three-act structure that is a part of this uh, uh, version of this plot of the farce plays. Uh, in which the first part constitutes the preparation for the adulterous spree, usually set in a domestic space, the house. The second part is the evening, the party. It's uh, sometimes at a lodge, sometimes uh, uh, at a casino. Um, the adulterous spree takes on the second uh, part, and the third act is the morning after and dealing with the consequences of that aftermath uh, uh, for the couples involved. Now, Le Réveillon was very successful, and it was followed the same season and by the same authors with Les Sonnettes, um, a play that was then translated into German and adapted as the operetta, and I apologize for my German, the operetta Die Fle der Maus, with music by Johann Strauss. Uh, I don't imitate German any better than I imitate uh, Lubitsch or any other. Uh, but I try. Johann Strauss uh, had the music, this operetta, uh, premiered in Vienna. Importantly, at Vienna, I'll just make note of that because our film tonight is set in Vienna. Uh, it was in 1874, and 43 years later, Ernst Lubitsch, uh, along with his scriptwriter, Hans Krali, adapted Die Fledermaus twice. Well, the first time, uh, 43 years later, uh, as Das Fidel gave fungus, uh, translated into English as The Merry Jail in 1917, and also as So This Is Paris in 1926. Um, this is one of the films, uh, by the way, that I was talking about, So This Is Paris, uh, a really amazing film that simply does not exist in a good printer condition and that our, our new union uh, is going to work to, to preserve, uh, to collect the, uh, the Lubitsch works. Now, we can take a quick look. Uh, we have a sense of uh, this plot and, and this tradition that Lubitsch is drawing from. Um, 
So this is Paris actually had as its working title simply Réveillon, uh, referring to, uh, to the operetta. Uh, we have in The Merry Jail um, a real easy sense of here's how the three acts are working out, but here's also we can see what Lubitsch is doing with the kind of cinematic texture. Um, of this plot. Here we have the opening act with the husband being found. Uh, he's been called to jail uh, before behaving uh, poorly and been drunk in the streets, and his wife and housemaid find him. When we pull back, we realize that he's fallen down in front of his desk, um, and that close-up shot is the first we see, and we're kind of out of, oriented in a different space. Uh, we have the sequence in which we are at the ball, and this is the wife in masquerade, um, and this is her husband who has convinced uh, others that he has gone to jail, has someone masquerading for him, so he can have this, uh, this night out. Uh, at the same time, the maid has also made it to the party and is indulging her appetites. Meanwhile, uh, there is a party going on, um, with our Emil Jannings at the uh, prison where uh, uh, the husband's friend is masquerading um, uh, as the husband and uh, there's a, a card party going on. Now, it, we'll have the culminating scene uh, in which the, the next morning where the, the wife and husband confront one another and all is resolved. Um, I wanted to show you, though, just to kind of, again, get a sense of the way that Lubitsch is playing cinematically with what is a very well-known uh, farce plot, operetta plot. Um, and I simply want to show you one scene from the party, a dance sequence. Uh, if we can play clip, please. As um, uh, I love the roller skates. Um, but it also, it speaks not just to a kind of fun, the pleasure, that kind of the twinkle in the eye, but it also speaks to this, a certain kind of uh, version of the modern that, that Lubitsch is pushing this plot towards um, and beginning here in 1917 with his Berlin film, in which he pushes even further in 1926, which, so this is Paris, um, the Charleston, the dance of the Charleston scene is simply amazing and it is one part of that film that's available and um, circulates on YouTube. I encourage you to look it up if you want to really learn how to do the Charleston. Um, now, I've been tracing, I've been saying, is this a theatrical farce tradition? Is it the operetta? Um, what is the distinction between these? The operetta, defined in the loosest terms, would be light opera. Um, the lightness of tone, often thought of as frivolous, one of the terms that characterizes uh, that particular genre. We might say that it is the operetta that begins to define Lubitsch's career, particularly if we jump forward, or for those of you who have been attending the series, jump back a few weeks. Uh, because Lubitsch, um, as you may know, adapted the 1907 operetta, The Merry Widow, in 1934. I believe, actually it's more than a few weeks, I believe uh, you screen that on, in February here at the series. Now, in The Merry Widow, uh, for those of you who did not have the opportunity to, to see it, uh, we have Jeanette MacDonald, who plays so Sonia. She is the wealthiest woman in the kind of constructed kingdom of Marshovia. She has left the country She's uh, and gone to Paris, a very particular modern site, the city. Uh, they send Maurice Chevalier, is playing Count uh, Don Liu. They send him after her to court her and attempt to uh, marry her in order to get her back in the kingdom so they can have her money so the country won't go bankrupt. But on her first night in Paris, Sonia goes in disguise as Fifi, one of any number of Fifis who are at the uh, Maxime's, a nightclub in Paris. There she meets Maurice Chevalier's character, Count Don Liu, and in a private room lures him to dance with a waltz. Clip, please. And she sings. Now, the operetta is one thing. The theatrical farce is another. These references and this tradition from the 19th century that, uh, that Lubitsch draws from, and that, which I'm arguing is permeating uh, his thoughts about uh, his uh, filmmaking as he moves through his career uh, lends itself to indulging ourselves in another clip. Uh, this one, uh, not to give away 
uh, a film from 1939, Ninochka, which I believe will be played here in a month's time. Uh, not to give too much away, but in, uh, I, I apologize, um, uh, in Angel, uh, which was here two weeks ago. Uh, I'll get to Ninochka momentarily. Uh, uh, in Angel, there is a moment in which the uh, opera Verissimo uh, is invoked. And it is invoked at a moment um, and in, the, in a, a film that is about uh, a woman played by Marlene Dietrich, who's known only as Angel, or Angel, uh, by Tony uh, Moulton, uh, played by Melvin Douglas. Um, and they meet in an opening scene in Paris, uh, for those of you who um, have seen the film. Turns out she is married to Sir Frederick Barker um, in London. The film shifts to London. Uh, we are there. It turns out that Tony Halton is an old friend of Sir Frederick Barker. They meet uh, in London. They reignite their friendship. It turns out they shared a lover during the war um, and go to uh, Sir Frederick Barker's home where uh, there is a, a realization between uh, uh, Tony and Marlene Dietrich's character uh, that all is not uh, as it had seemed. Uh, now, that night, uh, the couple, the married couple, are going to the opera, which Angel, or Maria, likes and her husband does not. This is the scene that takes place. I want to just have you listen to the, it's one of those kind of exquisite secondary, seemingly secondary scenes in a Lubitsch film that I think is very telling. Uh, clip, please. The piece from The Barber of Seville is meant to be played for comedy. Uh, and it is an opera comique. At the same time, the, the opera Verissimo, uh, which is being referred to, the Cavalleria Rusticana, becomes, in the context of Lubitsch's film, also a comic touch, as well as a, a play reflexively commenting on the larger film um, and the plot of adultery itself, uh, or potential adultery. The question becomes, what sort of exquisite trio, as he says, will they make uh, as the film proceeds? Will there be love, jealousy, hate, and murder by the film's end? Knowing Lubitsch, we can leave, I believe, the murder, for the most part, aside. But there will certainly be a part uh, granted to secondary characters such as Edward Everett Horton. Now, thus far, I've been teasing out these, these uh, references to 19th century traditions. But what are we to call these films? What, how, what categories? Uh, can we use? In the most obvious of senses, uh, as well as the most traditional perhaps, Lubitsch's works are referred to as intelligent or sophisticated sex comedies. Uh, now, they, that is a tradition that runs through the films that I've shown. It runs all the way through, uh, even Clooney Brown. Um, in the general sense, if we use that type of generic category, it does serve a purpose. It enables us to place Lubitsch's work relative to that of his Hollywood contemporaries, such as George Cukor, who made Philadelphia Story, Holiday, Adam's Rib, Dinner at Eight, The Women, or Billy Wilder with Sabrina, The Seven Year Itch, Some Like It Hot, The Apartment, Preston Sturgis, Sullivan's Travels, The Lady Eve, or Gregory Lacava, My Man Godfrey, Howard Hawks, 20th Century, George Stevens, The Talk of the Town, I Could Go On. Of course, many of these films, as with those directed by Lubitsch, could also be called and have been called a comedy of errors uh, or simply romantic comedy. Regardless, if we take them together and use this generic category, they can be considered and have been from a sort of what I call an aerial view, uh, one of the many genres that then together comprise a larger category uh, called or termed classical Hollywood cinema. Now, this is a category most often associated with the work of David Bordwell, who has pronounced studio-era U.S. cinema from the 1920s to the 1950s, actually to 1960, uh, as he puts it, as defined in toto by, and I quote, narrative continuity, clear definition of space, covert narrational presence, and control of rhythm, end quote. Although some of these features do pertain to a persistent style in this era of American narrative cinema, the totalizing category is objectionable at many levels, not least because classicism is anachronistic for defining the emergence of specifically modern modes of representation. 
Now, perhaps the most off-sided objection to the category of classical cinema comes from the belated and much missed uh, friend uh, and excellent scholar, Miriam Hansen. Now, by jettisoning classical and replacing classical uh, uh, with her term that she coined vernacular modernism, um, Hansen emphasizes the way that cinema of this period appeals to mass audiences by reflecting the modernity of which it is a crucial part. As she wisely notes of Bordwell's term, and I quote, a key problem seems to lie in the very concept of the classical as a historical category that implies the transcendence of mere historicity, as a hegemonic form that, cl that claims transcultural appeal and universality. Already in its 17th and 18th century usages, the neoclassicist recourse to tradition, in whatever way it may be misread or invent a prior original, does not take us through history, but instead to a transhistorical ideal, a timeless sense of beauty, proportion, harmony, and balance derived from nature." End quote. Refusing a derivation from nature, Hansen places studio era cinema in the context of the modernity of mass production, mass consumption, and mass annihilation. But let us note, she does not call this vernacular modernity. Rather, she redefines the aesthetic of high modernism, usually understood as an absolute resistance or rejection of a burgeoning mass cultural movement in the early 20th century. I quote, while the spread of urban industrial technology, the large scale disembedding of social and gender relations, and the shift to mass consumption entailed processes of real destruction and loss there also emerged new modes of organizing vision and sensory perception, a new relationship with things, different forms of a mimetic experience and expression of affectivity, temporality, and reflexivity, a changing fabric of everyday life, sociability, and leisure. From this perspective, she continues, I take the study of modernist aesthetics to encompass cultural practices that both articulated and mediated the experience of modernity, such as the mass produced and mass consumed phenomena of fashion, design, advertising, architecture, urban environment, of photography, radio, and cinema. End quote. It does sound pretty good. Yet, this working definition is remarkably indistinct. And I would refer you to a, a lovely piece that Daniel Morgan, who had previously been a student of uh, Miriam uh, Hansen's and, and that he wrote with all honor, um, published two years ago in uh, New German uh, Criticism, New German Critique. Uh, in which he talked about uh, the way in which that, uh, that Hansen simply does not uh, uh, interpret films in this very canonical and off-sided piece, that actually it becomes such a vague category that almost anything and almost any medium um, could be taken to be vernacular modernism. Where do we draw the lines? What does vernacular modern, modernism mean? And he makes the call, an urgent call, to move to the level of interpretation, and that that is only where we could begin to define and think about the uses of the term. Now, the fact is that Hansen did uh, make an interpretive move, um, a very, very interesting one. Um, she did this in an essay in which she turned and utilized the concept of vernacular modernism to think about Shanghai cinema um, in the 1920s um, and 1930s. Um, and I've put the title here on the board in, per, per, in part because I want to emphasize this kind of vertical axis, uh, that there is the fallen woman and the rising star. Um, and those two are what she wants to tease out in order to make an argument um, about this, these shifting gender roles and how they're playing out in modern cinema. Uh, she makes a, a kind of quick gloss in saying that these films, one of the ways in which they are vernacular modernism is the way that they play with a city-country antithesis. But her primary concern is to think about the figure of the woman. Um, um, and to think about the way that the contradictions of modernity are, and I quote, enacted through the figure of the woman, 
very often literally, across the body of the woman who tries to live them but more often than not fails, who has to become a corpse by the end of the film. As in many 19th century literary traditions, women function as metonymies, if not allegories, of urban modernity, figuring the city in its allure, instability, anonymity, anonymity and illegibility, which is often suggested through juxtapositions of women's faces and bodies with the lights of Shanghai, abstracted into hieroglyphics. In more narrative terms, female protagonists serve as the focus of social injustice and oppression, rape, thwarted roman romantic love, rejection, sacrifice, prostitution function as a metaphors of a civilization in crisis." End quote. Now, because Hansen, in all of her essays on this subject, and because of the now transnational, the, the, the multinational citation of vernacular modernism, I, I feel it urgent to point out that it is a bit ironic that if vernacular modernism depends uh, in its every incarnation in Hansen's writing on the play with gender, and particularly the freedom granted to women um, in modernity, uh, and that this reflexivity of modern life is a part of what vernacular modernism is doing, then in order to recuperate the fallen woman, she must move her interpretation to extra filmic materials in the piece in Chang on Shanghai. She must think about stars in the way in which their star discourse rises uh, the fallen woman from this kind of catastrophic uh, position as allegory of a civilization in crisis. She also focuses on the way in which women were forming the majority of audiences in the period and draws from that to make her argument. Because I want to argue, and, and this is, a, is my central point, I want to argue that Lubitsch's films, in a tradition that begins with the marriage circle, complicates Hansen's model of vernacular modernism and urges us to seek another aesthetic and conceptual model for Hollywood cinema of this entire period. One that includes a distinctively modern, but not modernist, play with changing gender roles. Now, in doing so, it bears mention that the 1934 Shanghai film that Hansen lingers over as her predominant example, uh, which is called Daybreak, or translated as Daybreak, the Shanghai film, overtly cites and reenacts an earlier film that Joseph uh, von Sternberg made in 1931, which was a vehicle for Marlene Dietrich. Uh, it was dishonored, and it ends uh, with her, and I've put the two uh, images, it's cutting back and forth in the film between uh, Dietrich at the end, uh, other end of an execution line um, as she applies her lipstick um, and then the firing as she is shot and her death ends the film. It's important to, or I found it interesting to invoke this particular film because it also re uh, reminds us that in a much earlier uh, piece and also one of the most canonical um, in the tradition of um, at least Anglophone film studies is Laura Mulvey's 1975 essay, uh, uh, narrative cinema and visual pleasure, in which she takes von Sternberg's work with Marlene Dietrich and Alfred Hitchcock's work as the two uh, poles of support for her larger, once again, totalizing argument about this period of cinema, in which she says that throughout this popular tradition that developed in Hollywood, with its hege he hegemony over uh, world film markets that a masculinist and patriarchal gaze was structured, both through the gaze of the camera and structured through the male viewer's gaze, that did one of two things. It either glamorized the female um, as an object to be looked at uh, and took her into a kind of ethereal space as certain, as simply to be looked at, the scopophilic pleasure, or secondly, uh, it operated voyeuristically and the woman must be punished. With that in mind, Mulvey argued, uh, or ended her piece, which is truly a manifesto uh, in the uh, most profound sense of that term, with a call, a call to, and I quote, free the look of the camera into its materiality and time and space, and the look of the audience into dialectics, passionate detachment, end quote. Now, part of what Mulvey is doing is 
calling for what became a very important feminist uh, avant-garde tradition, including Mulvey's work herself in Riddle of the Sphinx in the late 1970s and 1980s. We could think of Michelle Citron, we could think of Chantal Ackermann, we could think of early Sally Potter. But what is holding together uh, these two pieces is this desire to either recuperate the popular as a vernacular modernism, um, or to do away with it altogether um, and call for uh, this, this uh, freeing in time and space. Now, I believe that rather than doing away with this tradition, um, and I speak as uh, with an eye towards this modern play of gender, that if we look at the traditional cinema of Hollywood cinema from the 1920s to the 1950s, that we will re recognize that within this tradition, indeed at the very apex of this uh, Hollywood cinema lies a different aesthetic altogether, one that fully embraces, even emblematizes, and certainly emerges as part of a distinctly consumer-oriented, pleasure-seeking mass culture in the 19th century. That aesthetic finds its most powerful articulation in the films of Ernst Lubitsch. It's an aesthetic that I will provisionally call, and here comes my new title, Here comes my new title. Here. Where's my new title? There's my new title. A uh, certain kind of kitsch. And we'll just take a moment. We, we had slides out of order there, so we had to take a moment. Um, kitsch. Now, I want to emphasize that I'm speaking of a certain kind of kitsch. And I do so because I'm inspired by Lubitsch's work um, to develop what I, am, I would call a poetics of kitsch. And I, when I think of Lubitsch and working with Lubitsch, I believe that we have a way, develop a way of employing the term kitsch as something other than a term of abuse. As defined by Clement Greenberg's well-known essay on the subject in the late 1930s, kitsch most often refers to the degradation of avant-garde or high art by the advent of the synthetic pleasures of popular culture. It is synonymous with poor taste or commercial values in the eyes of conservative defenders of elite culture and seen by traditional left-wing critics as symptomatic of false consciousness and the commodic commodification of art. Kitsch for these critics is fake, fraudulent, tacky, hackneyed, or counterfeit. For Theodore Adorno, kitsch is poison to the realm of genuine art. For all such critics, kitsch refers to an unredeemable embrace of vulgar sentimentality. Now, sentimentality from the perspective of these modernist elites is the emotion or affect at once shallow and empty. Gilles Dorfles, in his famous 1969 study, Kitsch, the World of Bad Taste, holds that kitsch, quote, is essentially the falsification of sentiments and the substitution of spurious, spurious sentiments for real ones, end quote. But how can one falsify sentiments? Did Hume not, in his thesis on the standard of taste, explain that, quote, the sentiment is always true, end quote? The sentiment sparked by kitsch, I agree, is different from the sentiment sparked by modernist and other forms of not, but it is no less true. Dorfles distinguishes the real feeling produced by modernist or avant-garde art from the sentimentality produced by kitsch and suggests that the latter is a falsification of the former. It seems to me that sentimentality is here produced in the form of a qualitatively distinct, but in no way false feeling. I believe Lubitsch would say the same, although I should clarify that to my knowledge, he never employed the term kitsch. However, essayist and philosopher Walter Benjamin did, and singularly among, alone among the great, most often German intellectuals of the 1920s and 1930s, Benjamin embraced the history and possibilities of a kitsch aesthetic. To make this point clearer and by way of one last detour before uh, returning you to the marriage circle, I will posit that Lubitsch offers us one of the most grandiose statements about a poetics of a kitsch aesthetic, of frivolity and of sentiment in his 1937 film, Nanachka. 
I promise not to spoil the plot for those of you who will be seeing this film um, in another month's time. Let me simply say that Anachka is played by Greta Garbo, that she is a special envoy from Russia sent to uh, get her comrades who have fallen prey to the lore of that modern city, get them back in order. And she has so embodied the Bolshevik party line that she is on her way to the Eiffel Tower in order to study its architectural structure that she may, she may bring that knowledge back. She runs into her co-star, played by Melwyn Douglas, along the way, and the trip to the Eiffel Tower turns out to be something a little different. Play clip, please. Now, I won't flip back in the slides, but I had wanted to show you this clip for two things, to articulate um, what I am thinking about in terms of thinking about the poetics of Kish. One of them um, uh, stems from um, the sense of the shimmer, the glitter, uh, as uh, Melwyn Douglas's character kind of points out these lights of Mamartra and elsewhere. But it also then becomes a part of the mise-en-scene and Garbo's dress with its shimmering um, diamonds as she goes to drink champagne with him um, and become a part of that modern city. The woman on the move in this very modern city is quite different from uh, Hansen's uh, discussion of vernacular modernism. Now, that is a term, this concept of the shimmer, um, is one that I was uh, kind of thinking about as well. A great book was um, just written by Daniel Tiffany. He's a literary historian who wrote um, a history of poetry and kitsch in which he kind of looks back to uh, one instance is Robert Herrick. He's looking back at the 17th and 18th centuries, um, who was intrigued by these kind of various translucent media, um, like the luxurious and diaphanous Tiffany, um, a kind of gauzy or linen veil through which the world, especially nature and erotic objects, appear to be essentially ornamental and even illusory. Um, and if we think of various, even the, the, the outfit um, worn in The Merry Widow uh, by Jeanette MacDonald as she is dancing, um, and other forms of uh, these shimmering images, uh, we get at some aspect of this, uh, this concept of, of kitsch. But the other is the architecture, and that is why I find this moment in Nanachka so uncanny. Because although, given the voluminous writing that has been done on Walter Benjamin, um, including attention to his massive arcades project. There has been little to no attention. In fact, the only I know of is, is, is by Winfried uh, Menninghaus. There may be others written in German, um, of which I'm unaware but that have tracked his fascination with kitsch um, and his use of this term. And he talks about, in the Arcades uh, project, he discusses architecture as being um, part of this species of kitsch. And he very noticeably, in talking about the way that technology is beginning to remove uh, the architect from the artwork, uh, that these uh, different steel girders in different ways are coming in. The school of engineers come to replace that kind of relationship between art and object. It's the beginning of what he calls second nature. That is modernity, a world in which technology kind of dominates. Uh, he turns to Baron von Haussmann's uh, use of aesthetic perspectives in Baron von Haussmann, who innovated uh, and built modern Paris. Uh, the way that he embellished his grand boulevards is seen by Benjamin as a kitschy application of aesthetic ornaments to an urban organizing technique, essentially dissociated from all traditional forms of the fine arts. As he writes, and I quote, Haussmann's predilection predilection for perspectives, for long open vistas, represents an attempt to dictate art forms to the technology of city planning. This always results in kitsch, end quote. Now, that might sound negative, this dissociation from the fine arts, but it was not for Benjamin. Um, and I find this moment, again, uncanny, the pointing to uh, the Paris boulevards and the movement into Paris, the city, and the transformation of the woman um, and her shimmering uh, life uh, that emerges, at least briefly. I'm not giving away the end of Nanachka. Um, as a part of uh, a, a, a sentimentality, I'll use that term, that both Lubitsch and Benjamin share. Um, it bears mention that Benjamin also says this, and I quote, among the consecrated forms of expression, kitsch and art stand irreconcilably opposed. But for developing living forms, what matters is that, is that they have within them something stirring, useful, ultimately heartening, that they take 
kitsch dialectically up within themselves. Today, perhaps, film alone is equal to this task, or at any rate, more ready for it than any other art form. And whoever has recognized this will be inclined to disallow the pretensions of abstract film, as important as its, its experiments may be. He will call for a closed season on, a natural preserve for, the sort of kitsch whose providential site is the cinema. End quote. This is how I understand the work of Ernst Lubitsch in a tradition of modern Hollywood, Hollywood marked by the marriage circle. I understand it, that is to say, in the way that Benjamin do, uh, uh, calls for the cinema, which is by no means simply embracing kitsch qua kitsch, but rather calling for strategies of dialectically acknowledging and transforming it, rather than merely condemning it as an instance of bad taste. Now, I do not mean to imply that Lubitsch read uh, notes from the Arcades Project. Uh, indeed, I imagine that a line of such influence would be impossible. Um, but insofar as Lubitsch performs this dialectical acknowledgment of kitsch that Benjamin called for and generates an alternative po poetics, uh, he offers us this something else, a different way of organizing um, cinema of the period. Now, to return to our viewing of the marriage circle for tonight, um, I should remind you that I began by tracing uh, Lubitsch's fondness for, indeed, some would say his imitation of and, and reenactment of 19th century theatrical farces, as well as his play with renditions of the operetta and the opera comique. If we follow George Bernard Shaw's condemnation of these theatrical farces as banal, wearisome, and repetitious, or if we recall French philosopher Henri Bergson's claim by using uh, the farce tradition to argue that the comic is always related to the mechanical, we might say that farce uh, and the operetta are in some ways kitsch avant la lettre. If farce and that sort of kitsch is false and insincere. Uh, it is certainly taken up as such in an alternative tradition. It is that 19th century literary tradition that I want to just mention by way of uh, giving you a kind of uh, a sensibility um, or a grasp of this shift that I want to make in terms of thinking about the tradition of uh, a modern aesthetic. If we return to thinking even just briefly about uh, Offenbach's work and the operettas, and if we realize that Emil Zola was, uh, was taken to one of Offenbach's uh, uh, operetta pieces and introduced behind the stage uh, to uh, the girls that were st various stars um, at the time in the 1860s um, and 1870s, uh, he wrote a novel titled Nana that was inspired uh, by his visit the, to the Théâtre des Variétés uh, and to his experience. And he took this character of Nana as a young girl who was a, a kind of a working class girl and a streetwalker. And he uh, created a fictional version of, the, of one of the uh, 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 Offenbach's uh, operettas, and Nana appeared in it. She's a teenage girl, but suddenly uh, uh, Zola writes in his uh, Nana, which is a kind of emblematic of the emergence of a literary naturalism. She was no longer a girl, but a woman with all the madness of her sex, and hungry and desirous. Now, Nana does devour and destroy essentially all of the men who pursue her, but in allegorically speaking, all of Paris and ultimately all of France. And Zola will punish her for that. At the very end of the novel, he has Nana die of smallpox. And he writes, and I quote, what lay on the pillow was a charnel house, a heap of pus and blood, a shovel full of putrid flesh. The pustules had invaded the whole face so that one pock touched the next, end quote. And outside Nana's window as she dies, the crowd is madly cheering, to Berlin, to Berlin, to greet the start of the Franco-Prussian War, which will end in defeat for France and the end of the Second Empire. 
That is the tradition that leads through to a model of vernacular modernism in terms of the play with gender and this figuration of the woman. It is the reason why if we say we agree, and I believe that we inevitably must, that uh, Zola takes a form of kitsch, the operetta, and transforms it into this form of naturalism to, and punishes the woman as the allegory of the city and of the nation in crisis, uh, that Lubitsch is doing the reverse. He is taking kitsch, that farce tradition, the operetta tradition. He is even taking the opera verissimo tradition from the 19th century and transforming them through his velvety, insinuating direction, taking modern forms of infidelity, of women's sexual promiscuity, of changing forms of gender relations and norms, the very epitome, the very central apex of modernity, and transforming them into a poetics. He does not let us lose sight, and he himself does not lose sight of the very uh, emblem of what it means to be popular uh, and to be part of a popular culture. I believe that it's important that we do not uh, attempt to do away uh, in our scholarly or academic work, work with that conception of the popular, to move to a call for a freeing of the camera in time and space, uh, or to uh, call for a vernacular and everyday sort of modernism. We do, we do a disservice to the histories of the period and to the mass culture that was burgeoning at the time, and we certainly do a disservice to our understanding of what we now call modern Hollywood, that period beginning in the 1920s. Now, I could speak of the term modern Hollywood and Lubitsch's role uh, within it, I could speak further, but I won't, uh, of other 19th century traditions uh, that come to inform uh, cinema of this period. I will say that if there were world enough in time, it would be worth thinking about the tradition of the melodrama, which uses the woman's body as a kind of figure of virtue and of suffering, uh, a sort of kind of hysteria and of uh, lost innocence. Um, this is predominantly in the work of D.W. Griffith, and I mention that simply because it is uh, part of a tradition that was quite popular uh, with audiences in the 1910s and was losing its popularity as Lubitsch comes to play uh, in Hollywood. Uh, with that said, I want to uh, play one last clip for you, uh, this time to hand the table over, the podium over to Peter Bogdanovich, who has just asked a question of John, Ren John Renoir of what he thought of Lubitsch. Play clip, please. Uh, watching this film, uh, The Marriage Circle, let me end by saying this, that if we were to think of the substance of Lubitsch's poetic kitsch, as I am calling it, uh, it must be understood in a related sense as flaunting the presumed device of cosmetic materialism. Uh, indeed, the cosmetic nature of kitsch usually invites us to think in terms of sham materialism or sheer materialism an orientation, a signature, marching, marking the enigma of the surface. In the marriage circle, as with Lubitsch's body of work that follows, we find an aesthetic that distorts and lies on the surface, that plays with ornamentation, centered on the female aesthete and woman of fashion. Indeed, to recall the voiceover uh, explanation from the montage from The New Yorker with which I began, the film we are about to watch plays with deceptive appearances, with the marks, quote, of a highly coded society in which identity is closely bound up with a properly maintained social image. Even in the most intimate of spaces, interactions between characters take place behind an almost impossible, impossible false front, end quote. Through Lubitsch's velvety, insinuating direction, we feel the shivers of a rich ambiguity of human morality and ethics shimmering just below that surface. It is questionable to call it a poetics of kitsch, kitsch I wonder. Is it questionable uh, to think of the entirety of Hollywood cinema in this period from Lubitsch? I don't think so. I do, however, think that it's questionable to keep reiterating what was indeed a 
production, um, or sorry, marketing technique, to try and understand Lubitsch through that oft-repeated term, the Lubitsch touch, although I have to admit I do like it. But I will leave you to consider the marriage circle and think through, if I may, if I dare, perhaps a new term, the Lubitsch kitsch. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for this inspiring lecture. Your applause. And please welcome again Jennifer Bean and Mark Siegel on stage. Yeah. Here's your mic. Okay. Um, danke, danke, Uwe. Um, great. Okay. Ich um, switch you wieder ins Englische. Um, Jennifer, um, your fantastic presentation opened up so many perspectives. Um, on positioning Lubitsch, on mm -hmm. rethinking um, the relationship of modern cinema, if you will, to 19th century uh, popular forms, um, rethinking Laura Mulvey, so from a film historiographical perspective, the way in which she casts um, um, her feminist look at um, modern cinema, if we take now, uh -huh. now a term that you're working with. Um, and then you you kind of um, push the term kitsch mm -hmm. tentatively, mm -hmm. but still assertively. I am in Germany. <laughs> I realize. I mean, it's a. I'm, I don't know how much. Uh, uh, there's still, I think, a genealogy of kitsch that's it's kind of a secret in terms of uh, of of how it's being played out. And that's what Daniel Tiffany is doing with in mm. in terms of thinking about poetry going back to the 18th century. But but most trace it to. Um, its roots in uh, a kind of German ideology, uh, uh, usually in the 1870s. Kitsch, mm -hmm. like um, a kitchen, uh, kitchen, like it's a, um, a word that was used in painting uh, to kind of scrape uh, something off or scrape something off the street even, like sludge. So mm -hmm. it kind of came to have these connotations of like mm -hmm. something that was like daubing, the daub of paint or mm -hmm. even... Uh, some other words uh, that were associated with it to make it kind of think of, of, of junk. Uh -huh. So it's so it's kind of a hard word to sell, mm -hmm. but m my work to recover it um, uh, is part of that that kind of larger. I mean, that sense of urgency I feel to 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 rethink. I mean, what are the terms? What are the organizing terms? And I don't know. I was curious. Um, I, because I didn't linger on the marriage circle, mm. uh, it, and wanted to move to the other films to put this in in that larger um, place, but I didn't know if anyone thought about the, the that kind of three act structure that was so mechanistic that mm -hmm. that, that Bergson talked about, that um, uh, Shaw talked about in terms of the farce, because you see it here, but you see how delicately it's been kind of re. Uh, remade, you have you know the kind of act one you open in the house, but here we have two houses, um, so we go back and forth between uh, we open mm -hmm. when in the um, uh, bronze house, a stocks house, and we move to the bronze house. Uh, each have a kind of you know morning together. I mean, act two in that uh, theatrical farce tradition is the spree, the adulterous spree, and it's it's the night of a party, um, and here. We have the night of a party, you know, mm -hmm. it's the dinner party mm -hmm. and there's all, you know, all the exchanges. And then act three is the kind of, you know, consequences in the aftermath. But you see how it's just mm -hmm, even mm -hmm. at that level of the plot, it's it's uh, uh, become a, a, a poetics, you know, of a different sort without leaving behind, um, importantly, the way in which in this film, uh, it's that it happens quickly at the end. You think Mitzi's going to going to be the one kind of left out, you know, mm -hmm. and kind of shunted. And then you have the two uh, who were desiring and, and uh, the other, d desiring a married uh, person to kind of pair it off, just ru 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 uh, driving off into the, into the night. It's mm -hmm. just perfect. Uh, yeah, no, that's perfect fantastic. Closure. Yeah, yeah, perfect. There's, um, Rembert, I, I immediately saw you have a question. Yeah. Yes, so um, 
I like very much what you uh, what you did in this um, re rethinking Hansen's uh, notion of the vernacular modernism and in a way shifting it a little bit in this direction of Kitsch. And I think what you can see within the film is also what one can accomplish when you when one has this uh, almost operative notion of uh, of, of Kitsch and how it how it generates a certain attentiveness uh, not only. Um, uh, to gestures, uh, but only to uh, also to objects and uh, and the circulation of objects. So uh, so there is, and uh, I would love uh, like to to come back to uh, to this one intertitle that I loved very much. Um, after the big big party ends, the small party start. starts. <laughs> and I want to take this as a theoretical thought uh, in in the in the way of of your thoughts, namely, um, and perhaps I'm going too far right now. But what is interesting about when you rethink um, um, Hansen, uh, uh, Hansen's notion of the vernacular modernism with uh, with this notion of kitsch, isn't the the big unmarked elephant in the room? Isn't this a concept of modernism and modernity that we still drag around in in all our readings? So and that, that's why I found your talk so liberating. Yes. Um, because uh, there's one thing that uh, that we cannot get rid of. Uh, it's that um, that each notion of this uh, of modernism and modernity is still deeply embedded in uh, in a philosophy of history. So uh, and we, we can be as smart as, as we want. So it's it's a big party, and uh, <laughs> but uh, but the time <laughs> of the big party is over. I think so. Um, and it's not just Latour when he says we have never been modern. Uh, but in a way, uh, to to switch atten uh, attention to this to uh, to this little operation. So not not to talk about um, modernity in a way, but thinking about terms such as kitsch in a way um, uh, to to get an idea how um, how these various how the objects are uh, kind of um, how they aligned. Uh, um, to the gestures, uh, to the little plots, and then you can uh, one also gets a new idea of how how this works in the context of uh, of the genres of the nineteenth century. So uh, mm -hmm. with uh, with the father, so um, I don't know is this too far fetched or is this but but in, in a way I was so inspired by your talk in a way that you um, that in a way thinking more in terms of notions such as kitsch also helps us to to finally perhaps rethink or get rid of. Uh, of these heavy notions of modernity and mm -hmm. modernism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, um, I actually, if I, I will cite you, but to take that intertitle, that was brilliant. Um, in terms of teasing it out, you know, to, 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 to think about how we practice um, historiography, film and media um, historiography, and how we organize. Um, films relative to that because as we were talking at dinner it's kind of like and as peter bogdanovich is saying uh i mean lubitsch was he was the star you know he was as as you know doubt no the the u.s studio system as it emerged just courted and lord like you know as many german artists as they could but lubitsch was the first and uh with these uh kind of larger organizing broad scale, what I was calling totalizing paradigms, um, it's one of the reasons in academic discourse, which is in its connection with kind of critical discourse that we were talking about, the Cahiers de Cinema group, and why they chose certain directors, it's one of the reasons uh, Lubitsch has been kind of jettisoned, even though if you look at the popular level, um, he was he was at the, co at the core of it. So um, I would say that you know, one of the um, one of the things is that, and this is where I get, I fall into that trap as well. Is that for me, Kitsch, I begin to think of it first. I thought I'm thinking through it just with Lubitsch, but then I begin to think how if we put Lubitsch at the center, that that larger group of directors I mentioned, uh, Billy Wilder, obviously being one of them. You know, Howard Hawks, uh, Gregory Lacava, that actually. Kitsch, even though they don't have that same relationship to the 19th century, once reading it through Lubitsch, I began to spiral, spiral, spiral outward, you know, to think uh, about a broader aesthetic um, uh, in cinema of the period. But I won't push that too far because I like that taking it to the smaller, smaller party. Yeah. Can and, I? And no one quite gives, I mean, women. A a and different forms of what I was calling modern modes of infidelity. Uh, no one quite does that in the and gets away with it, um, it the way that Lubitsch does. Um, and if you think of something like Design for a Living, I don't, it's not a part of the series. Mm -hmm. it, it, oh, it is. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you just don't 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 see that uh, uh, with anyone else. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I can I just um, ask? I I also like the gesture to displace, let's say, the big party of modernism with the little party, if you will, of kitsch. But but suddenly, like, kitsch becomes like adulterous, uh, which I like. I like. I like. No, I'm I'm all for adultery. I'm all for um for the yeah. um. <laughs> That's a high but, five yeah. right there. Yeah. I'm all for divorce. Um, for all of these, I'm all for this kind of um, you know replication of and, and, and fetishization of men that we see here, and also the reduction of men uh -huh. to body parts uh -huh. um, for um, so that they're uh, replaceable. Um, but but what I just would like to better understand is um, is then is how let's say we talk about this film in specifically if we use the poetics of kitsch as an analytical mm -hmm. framework, mm -hmm. how we can understand that with this film. And I just raise that just to throw out one example. I mean, because kitsch often is simply, it's the sentiment of other people. <laughs> it's like the sentiment that you don't like often. It's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's not just sentimental, but it becomes sentimental because it's the feelings of, of people who you don't necessarily value. It's the attribution. It's like those people like that, either that object or, or have some attachment, it seems to me to something that, that one wants to disdain. Like there's, but, but okay, I'm, mm -hmm. that's maybe, mm -hmm. we could discuss that if that's mm -hmm. applicable. But, but here it seems to me that, that kitsch is indeed marriage, is indeed like kitsch is like playing Greek, Greeks, uh, you know, ich liebe dich, this, this song, like the married couple is, uh -huh. is pure kitsch. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, and, and that Lubitsch is cri criticizing that is is yes, is playing yes. with that is making fun of that is breaking that apart. It's a kind of it's an analytics a, a, a kind of deconstruction, if you will. I don't know, yeah, but but of 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 kitsch. But what Lubitsch offers us is that a poetics of kitsch, or in, in what way? I want I want to be open to that. I'm just trying to think it through mm -hmm. how that mm -hmm. would work. Yeah, I'm. Uh, there's so many thoughts, and a anyone could jump in at any moment. Um, but because you you invoked Greek, and it was something I had intended to talk about, but the, the I was working to cut, cut, cut. Um, uh, was the Greek piece in the way in which when we're first introduced to Florence Vidor's character to Charlotte, mm -hmm. um, she's at the piano. We see a close up. We get the close shot on Edward Grieg, you know. Uh, in, in translated English, I love these. So it's like it's the heart of uh, romanticism um, in terms of of a musical tradition, um, and it's it's certainly rendered kitsch. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, what is uh, many would think of as kitsch. Uh, what, Oh, they would not call it as such, but I am because of the the kind of mechanistic, the sense of the hollow of the um, of the pretense that is that theatrical farce tradition or the operetta tradition mm -hmm. um, that's that it's emerging and flourishing in the nineteenth century, um, calling it kitsch, which is uh, something that that uh, that Lubitsch takes. I don't want to say seriously, but in some ways I do. Like he takes kitsch seriously, but then renders mm. kitschy. And I wanna—I kept playing with like a sense of what it would mean to to use kitsch as a verb um, in a kind of a way of, of trans in a, in a form of transvaluation to say like uh, like you often say. Uh, I mean, you're more an expert to say like uh, so and so like Todd Haynes queers uh, queers melodrama mm -hmm. to say that Lubitsch kitsch is. It doesn't quite work yet. Yeah, to, th this is kitsch, kitsch. romanticism, or uh -huh. um, to kitsch something uh -huh. uh, is a part of the process of of what he's doing. Um, but he's also, I mean, you mentioned objects, and I don't know what people were seeing in the uh, film, but those objects, that 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 scarf. I mean, it's just a moment everyone mm -hmm. laughed. You know, she, I, I held my scarf closer. He's like, "Are you getting cold?" And then the scarf comes off, and then we follow it. The object, those things that Hansen talks about, that things have this kind of animation. I mean, in Lubitsch, mm -hmm. you find it alive. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for your talk again. I, I enjoyed it. And I have a very practical question. Maybe it's a thought that went over my head. Um, why you singled out this film? Um, because you kept it as you. Um, 
said it was kind of a founding thing or your founding myth for the for the for the kitsch uh -huh. you uh -huh. went from this film to develop this uh this thought about kitsch but i didn't quite see the difference from maybe you can tell me uh -huh. about the films that were earlier like the Ozzy Osvalda vehicles that he made in in Europe mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. um the parodies of of uh, I don't know of uh, um, Romeo and Juliet in im Schnee or something like that these yeah well actually um I do and in fact when when Mark wrote and asked me if I would come I and if I had suggestions and I said well um my favorites are the doll de poop uh which I had, you know, and I said, and I love the marriage circle. And he said, well, we've already got someone doing the doll. So, <laughs> and in fact, in an earlier incarnation, I did want to trace and think about those kind of, I mean, I think Deep Poop is that, that, that intense stylization that he's playing with, and, you know, and setting himself up as, as the puppeteer of a world that is itself mechanistic and artificial. I mean, it's the perfect uh, kind of articulation of, um, a variation on the poetics of kitsch I'm talking about. The difference being it's uh, a different type of tale. Uh, it's, it's certainly that theme of deception and artifice. I mean, the, the, with Oswaldi kind of performing as a doll, uh, you know, in the uh, still like the appetites, people's appetites when she's at the wedding scene and then she's, he moves away and she grabs his food and she's shoving it in and then being the doll again. Um, in other words, there's certainly there's elements of this definitely that run through. But uh, once we decided on the marriage circle, then I that's when I really began to think about um, the importance of uh, rethinking this kind of classical cinema uh, vernacular modernism, which I've been working on with in other materials. And um, the marriage circle is just a film that I feel has been just far too overlooked for many reasons. Um, and it uh, made sense to kind of, you know, it, it, it functions at least in terms of the that U.S. cinema perspective to make the argument there. But I don't want to overlook what you're saying because then as soon as we do that, not only are we going back, importantly, to the 19th century and its various traditions, but we're also going back to his work in Berlin. In other words, the way in which this kind of U.S. cinema or Hollywood cinema kind of takes on this sense of uh, its its global hegemony, and it's and is often in our our canons then structured in opposition to these art cinemas that are German expressionism. And here's and I love Murnau. Don't get me wrong. You know I love um, uh, so many of uh, of the great films. I love Pandora. I lo you know, but it's but Lubitsch is different and makes that cross uh, between. Uh, Europe and specifically German and the German film industry and uh, and the U.S. industry and makes that not quite so uh, great a divide uh, in interesting ways. Yeah, yeah uh, very he nice. kitches it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's actually more a remark to Mark <laughs> because. Uh, you said that uh, the marriage is the kitsch, but it's also the broken marriage is also the kitsch. I mean, if you, it's very symmetrical. If you think of, uh, you see the browns first, and no, the stocks, no. Uh, well, the, the stocks. happy. You see the happy <laughs> first, and then you see uh, Monjou and and Mitzi, and uh, uh, I mean that's kitsch too. What they perform there. In in, in what sense? Well. I mean, how she throws um, his stuff away and throws in the other uh, corner, and then how he is looking when he's shaving or so because he's annoyed. I think that's pretty kitschy too. I guess. I yeah, guess it comes. That's starts, part of the maybe yeah. the difficulty I have with the term mm. kitsch is it, it can mean everything, it, uh, and <laughs> that it. Or sorry, mm. I, I don't mean to. to I don't know I if mean that's. It's, if it's that's over. It's, it's overdone in a uh, in a way. That's what I would say there. Mm -hmm. Maybe and it's camp. Well, see, I, 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 I just, camp are often I, I just, I just wanted to, yeah. to yeah, point yeah. the direction whether you can uh, make connection to camp there. I don't know. Yeah, there's, uh, uh, I mean, um, Eve Sedgwick, um, I don't know if you know of Eve Sedgwick's mm -hmm. writings mm -hmm. on kitchen mm -hmm. camp mm -hmm. um, um, in, in her book, Epistemology of the Closet, but um, where she discusses them both under the sign of the sentimental mm -hmm. and makes, mm -hmm. she makes, she follows Hermann Broch's um, 
um, articulation of the kitsch man, kitsch man, the kitsch man, um, in order to um, come up with a distinction where she says that um, kitsch is a form of attribution mm -hmm. and camp a form of recognition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so kitsch is often a, a kind of class-based disdain for, let's say, the objects that other people would like the kind of affective exactly. relationship to objects and things that that people have um, so that that it's kitsch has the gesture of you go to a flea market and you buy something that you think is so ugly um, nobody could like that um, so I'm gonna buy it and have it at home and all of my friends will come over and see it and recognize that of course he doesn't really like that he he has a kind of second degree relationship to it a relationship to it that's filtered through the kind of likes of people that actually he sort of disdains. Um, and therefore, he kind of redeems it by taking it out of its context. Whereas Camp, she says, in a kind of, I don't know, like, part <laughs> like Sedgwick, yeah. partisan, um, rah, rah, like gay, queer Camp, Camp is a recognition where you look at the object and you say, um, who could have mm -hmm. um, who who, who could have conceived of yeah. that? That's amazing. Um, it's as if I conceived of it, mm -hmm. and there must be other people around who also like that object. Mm -hmm. And so there's a form of recognition that she distinguishes from the attribution. And so I guess here I'm in my kind of polemic distinction. I'm saying marriage, ew, seriousness about marriage, um, over the top seriousness. That's kitsch. And the camp would be the just, but I'm, but I think, mm -hmm. but I, that gets us into trouble. And I feel like you know, no, maybe no, what you're saying, you, what opens it up, is just that the feeling that right. that's kit, is it a poetics of kitsch simply be, because it's all dealing with the realm of sentiment, um, um, marriage, um, infidelities. That that in a sense, what I got us into is is a false um, way of discussing it. That when you compared it to Murnau. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it seems sort of kitschy to me, but but okay. But no, when you compare it to Murnau, like that's <laughs> it's hard to stop. You yeah, know, like yeah. Murnau as opposed to um, Lubitsch, that maybe Lubitsch gets under um, recognized for his, you know, the greatness of the small party mm -hmm. because it's dealing with personal relations with with infidelity sentiment. I'm sorry, I've mm -hmm. talked way mm -hmm. too much. It's your no, space. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. And yeah. I, uh, I mean, the Sedgwick, I, I definitely, you know, I thought through because. Because I had to think through well, what's the relationship between camp and kitsch, and yeah. and I think the thing though is that, and I understand exactly where you're coming from, where you started off earlier, and mm -hmm. kind of returning to now vis-a-vis -vis Sedgwick, which is that kitsch tends to be, you said that kind of sense of disdain, um, mm -hmm. or it's a marking of, okay, it's a, um, there's an, now I'm going to use the, the attributional is. Uh, is for kitsch in Sedgwick's in terms. In Sedgwick's terms, yeah, kitsch yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she takes it's an it from attribution, Brough. But uh, one of the ways you have to, un and, and uh, we won't try and parse all this out here now, but I think that uh, Sedgwick is writing in a period and uh, in which kitsch as a term changed dramatically in that kind of uh, post-World War II, uh, in the kind of way of what I dislike the term postmodernism too, but I'm not going to engage Jameson right now. Um, but the Andy Warhol kind of taking up of you know Campbell soup cans, kitsch became quite a different thing, and uh, that tradition of marking kitsch as something that was you know an element to be disdained that certainly came out of those lightning rod debates. I mean. Kitsch was the term around which uh, many, I mean, Clement Greenberg, Theodore Adorno, you know, were working to kind of uh, uh, jettison kitsch. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, it's in many ways in their in their writings, um, like kitsch and the avant-garde, the the Greenberg piece from the late '30s. It's it's a way of 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 uh, of displacing um, as kind of abject. Uh, that which is contaminating art. So anything that's con easily consumable, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. anything that's pleasurable and gratifying. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it, it takes on a notion, and Benjamin is teasing this out. Um, there's part of the quote I read, but he goes on about it um, a little bit more, that it's important that things, that this, and that's what he likens to kitsch, that it be heartening. Um, that there be, and he talks about a kind of will to happiness. And he, and he talks about that, 
uh, I mean, I think uh, Benjamin is one of the, the greatest uh, sentimental uh, philosophers of our time, um, of the 20th century, and I mean, one of the greatest of them all. So it's, it's slightly different in that um, earlier context, but I think that there was someone I, something I read, and it was a brief piece. It was actually called Kitchen Bullshit, um, mm -hmm. kind of like playing off and thinking of those two terms relative to one another. Um, but I just remember in, in passing in this little piece that uh, the writer was saying that for the lover of kitsch, that the, the person who consumes and, and loves this, it's, it's not something you disdain. You don't even use the word kitsch. Mm -hmm. That kitsch kind of came into the vocabulary, and that's why Lubitsch doesn't use it, uh, in part came into the vocabulary as a way for elitists to disdain mm. the popular um, <laughs> and the sentimental and that which has this kind of, you know, um, you're going to have your happy ending, however kitschy it feels, tacked on, uh, you know, at the end of this piece. Um, in a similar way that if you've seen Lady Windermere's fan, which he makes in 1926, I mean, he really reworks Wild, but particularly in the ending, because you have this mother who's like sacrificing herself. She was a, some kind of sinning woman and had a child who didn't know her and everything's going to go awry, but she saves the day and then you think she's going to be just cast out into the world and she's lost the marriage. And in that last moment, she walks outside and just boldly says something to the man and off they go together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jennifer, can I just intervene for a second and ask about women? Um, yes. Did anyone <laughs> the, else oh, have a question too? Oh, Kalani, I didn't see it. Ah, there was a question back there. Well, if no one else asks about women, before you leave, we will talk about women. Um, yeah, okay. Kalani. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up with the kitsch discussion because I thought it was a provocative move and, and really interesting to move from touch to kitsch. But I was also thinking about the relationship, also when you were talking about the etymology of kitsch, something to do with materiality or working on material. And you also use the word shimmer in your talk which I thought was interesting because I thought both I can see in Lubitsch films and the films that we've watched um, but I guess I think of kitsch more in terms of uh, like a gesture or a move or something that punctuates the phone ringing during a kissing scene or the scarf coming off mm -hmm. it's something that comes out mm -hmm. at you or it's something that um, that you have to notice that you really don't have a choice mm -hmm. um, Whereas the, the shimmer seemed to me in the scene with Ninochka, for example, it seemed to be like it's part of a structure that's always there, but that with a shift in perspective, you then get to see. It's a shimmer on rocks or something when, when light hits it in a certain mm -hmm. way, but that shimmer belongs to the surface. Whereas kitsch seems, at least to me, maybe something like a, like an intervention or like a, a move to like punctuate the surface in some way or to punctuate expectations. Is there a relationship there between like kitsch and shimmer in Lubitsch films in terms of this, I don't know, whether it's temporality or, or structure? Mm -hmm. I like the way you're piecing that together. And now the shimmer The thing about the shimmer is, is that I was, I was tracing that to this kind of you know, this notion of this translucent media, uh, through which everything is filtered. I mean, as as a kind of um, idiom uh, that uh, uh, goes back to Robert Herrick's fascination with it. Um, that was from Daniel Tiffany again. It, his book is called My Silver Planet, which is a phrase from Keats. So. He was taking that that notion of like the planet, the silver planet, these these stereotypes. It's the moon is my silver planet, but the stereotype, this shimmering of it, then gets kind of transformed. I think of the same thing for for Lubitsch. I think his films are all shimmer. Uh, I mean, there's there's uh, the, the shimmer dominates, um, but the shimmer is is a kind of um, is like that. Um, uh, Tiffany, that, that kind of uh, gauze uh, glittering before us where we, where we see these, what, like as you're saying, objects pop out uh, because of, I, I, I'm, I'm not making that very concrete and what I want to do is make it concrete because, because you're raising Ninochka and 
And that gets to another issue altogether, but one that might clarify um, or, or move it, uh, the thinking in a different direction. And that is to say this, when um, many times kitsch has come to be and, uh, and was in the late 1930s and then again when Milan Kundera wrote about it in, and invoked it in The Unbearable Lightness of Being, that kitsch, because of its sense of it's shimmering, it's good, it it's, uh, makes us happy. So it's associated with uh, uh, propagandistic techniques, um, uh, such of those with Nazi uh, Germany and also with... Uh, any kind of party line, this uh, large-scale totalizing regimes. So there's a way in which, in pushing my thinking about Kitsch in Lubitsch, I think that when he gets to Ninochka, uh and he's taking that kind of Bolshevik party line, and th he's playing the two against one another, um, Kitching the kind of happiness and sentiment of like all this glitter of Paris and this shim that kind of shimmer against this happiness and and it's it's another way of i mean it, it would take us and this is not the time nor the place to talk about to be or not to be but but it's 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 a part of what what his project is um so i've moved away from that sense of the objects and we're moving away from the marriage circle in particular which might help ground us but you're pushing my the buttons that i keep kind of uh kind of i I'm still just thinking through yeah in really interesting ways yeah. yeah, Jennifer. Yes. You've been one of our most interesting speakers so far. I've been to thank a few. you. And I want to thank you for bringing a little bit of the Northwest flavor to Frankfurt because that's yes. where I'm from. I we were talking earlier. Yeah. That's right. And it's an old home. Because you have that dialect and that, that personality of <laughs> home. But I was going to Google it, but maybe you can be Schneller. Uh huh. Um, is kitsch a Yiddish term? It is because in mm. Hollywood there's so many. What, I, well, the, the that actually the filmmakers, it, sounds kind of Yiddish. I was going to Google it, but it, it, I'll call my grandma. You know, I have read so <laughs> many different um, genie. Um, I keep saying uh, etym etymological kind of attempts to trace it, and in I actually have I don't know what I did with my paper. I had it in in a set of notes that there's, and because I'm sorry, I would need to read it. Um, multiple German words that were played with. One of them is. Uh, Ver, ver kitchen, ver kitchen to, to kitchen. yes, yes, um, and a lot of words ending in ish that had to do with kind of like rubbish, with um, throwing away, getting rid of. Lubitsch. So, uh, Lubitsch, <laughs> see, Lubitsch kitsch. Yeah. You see <laughs> how I came to that? It was it's it's been a long long academic life uh, when you can coin phrases. <laughs> um, but I wanted to be playful and kitschy at the end. So so I don't know the answer to your question. I don't know that anyone um, does. There was another, um, uh, this was really early in, well, uh, Cluj is a um, uh, vast encyclopedia, uh, says that for some it came about in the, uh, in Europe, maybe not specific to Germany, but in Europe, and it was American kind of the tourists, uh, they still do it today, uh, coming and not wanting to uh, pay as much for a work of art, so they would uh, just pay enough to have it sketched. Uh, kind of like now, our, our, you know, getting a postcard uh, uh, today, and that that became kind of referred to as kitsch. Um, but again, I don't know any specifics, but I hadn't traced any um, a anything to Yiddish, but that would be really interesting. I mean, as yeah. you said earlier, kitching, I love that, that uh -huh. you wanted the verb earlier, but now you use it in the answer here. You said right, right. Lubitsch kitching this. <laughs> right. It sounded like kvetching and also, if it's but Yiddish, I think there's a Yiddish. As Yiddish too might explain, mm -hmm. a part of what in working through this talk became so fascinating to me that I had not thought through at all was the way in which I, be, I just really feel that Walter Benjamin and... Ernst Lubitsch share such a remarkable sensibility in so many ways. Both of them are kind of um, in one of the associations uh, uh, with sentimentality, I mean, Schiller wrote about this, is that it always implies uh, sentimentality, some kind of relationship to childhood um, and to the past. And so with both of these men, both of them uh, Jewish uh, intellectuals, uh, artists, the thinkers who... Um, have a 
Benjamin, obviously a fascination with childhood. Lubitsch, very childlike. I mean, you can't see the man without seeing him laughing. Um, and all these talks about him kind of playing on the set, and he would play every role for everyone. Uh, but also the past, and especially the 19th century for both of them, which they returned to again and again. And both of them uh, to the cities, to that modern city, whether it's Paris or Vienna, um, uh, or to... Uh, Actually, uh, Lubitsch has a thing for Constantinople. Uh, it comes up again and again and again. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, in, in different films. Yeah, um, I would like to come back to uh, your, uh, the point uh, you want to make to, uh, regarding women uh, representation and maybe in relation to this um, thoughts about the poetics of Kitsch and also what you were just saying about sentimentality, sentimentality or sentimentalism, which is uh, related to childhood but also to women a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, what is uh, uh, or how, how would you describe this poetic of Kitsch related to <coughs> yeah, women representation in this film or in Lubitsch film, and how uh, does it? Um, or to what ex extent does it diverge from other uh, forms or modes of women representation, for instance, in modernism or classical cinema, So, uh, w which is a little bit touch on women? Uh, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, that's uh, wonderful to phrase it that way, because um, in... S in some ways, I mean, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that's the the figure of um, the sentimental. And what else? I have at least five answers to your question. So I'm just, I'm going to stick with one, I think, um, and try not to verge into the other because I want to hear, hear the next question. One of them is, is this. Um, part of the... Uh, Part of a larger project I'm working on does have to do with, Lubitsch just entered it uh, because of this invitation for which I am eternally grateful because we I've spent the year then. I was like, I love Lubitsch, I'll go back through. And I'm in the meanwhile working on a book in which uh, a section of it, the last section is uh, working through with a whole variety of ways, this kind of limits and dangers of vernacular modernism. So um, there's that. One of the, one of the points that, um, is a part of a of a different piece of that project is thinking through the problems of say, of this vernacular modernism as a concept because insofar as one of the other uh, histories that it elides or collapses is the way in which um, the popular the mass culture was figured as to use Andrea Soisen's kind of famous um, equation, mass culture as woman. Um, and he uses the figure of, 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 um, of like Maria or Mariah from Metropolis, you know, as, as one example, but mass culture itself is threatening. Um, and it's, it's, it's Nathaniel Hawthorne's kind of, all of those, sc the scribbling mob of women uh, that he had to, to, to leave from. So these women writers that are associated with the sentimental novel, um, everything that as um, Hoysan traces in that, that, that piece from the 1980s where he says, you know, I mean, he, he uses uh, Flaubert you know, to say, and uh, to say, you know, who, who says I am Madame Bovary? Well, he's not. Um, you know, he he wants to be, but he's all of that kind of distancing, distancing, distancing from the sentimental tradition in writing um, that was associated with with this proliferation of women writers. And I don't have statistics in terms of Europe, but I have traced it in the U.S. Post Civil War, there were more women writing um, with more prolific output. Um, and at levels of bestsellers, both in terms of the serialized publication and newspapers and monthlies in the 19th century, um, up through the 1920s, that was five times more than the output of all male writers put together. So it's the sentimental in that sense, they, they get kind of jettisoned as, as, as writing these sentimental, frivolous pieces. And uh, when we then try and in incorporate, as Hansen is doing this, um, 
vernacular that every day uh, becomes then modernism, we lose sight of that very important um, and very harsh and very critical uh, debate that was taking place at the time. I don't know if that I scooted, skirted around your question because here, mass culture itself as woman and mass culture itself as sentimental is what becomes a problem as something that's non-thinking, as something that's gratifying. Um, I mean, so in other words, I'm taking it now from the small party of your question back to the large party of um, a kind of broader paradigm of thinking so that not just the individual women as, rep modes of, as, as they are represented, but really in an entire kind of sense of how do we think about the emergence of mass culture as it's being produced through these uh, both new technologies, uh, the printing press, which you know transforms writing, but so on and so forth. That's only one. I could have started with <laughs> melodrama instead and uh, talked about sentiment in that way, but yeah. <laughs> you could send her an email. There you go. Um, exactly. <laughs> no, no. It's, uh, did, yeah. There's another question. Yeah. But my question goes back to uh, Kitsch and the objects, if that's okay. Huh? Um, I thought about your linking between uh, Walter Benjamin and this movie, and um, I thought maybe this works also with um, techniques of using um, allegory instead of symbolism, because I think here the objects can arise and shine and move and shimmer because their work is allegories, not as fixed symbols, which is also linked to like concepts of modernism versus postmodernism or like somehow trying to work against fixed um, meanings within modernism which all works um, all work like symbols mm -hmm. like um, the I think the objects are not uh, even though the, the objects in the movie are um, always like tied to one person mm -hmm. like the scarf is Missy scarf and so on um, they uh, kind of become independent and work for themselves. And mm -hmm. so they're also always linked to another um, situation or another story or another person. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you think that this makes any mm -hmm. sense? <laughs> you know, you're getting at, um, you're getting at something that, that, I'm re that really interests me. And I will tell you where my thinking is at right now, but that, that could change. Um, it's changing as I speak. But that is this. I almost wrote, actually I did write and then I crossed it out. Um, because I began to think that um, in, co in comparison to the kind of way in which the, the, the fallen woman functions, as Hansen says, as um, a metonymy for uh, the city for a crisis in, in civilization, for the contradictions of modernity. She is allegorical um, in that way. And I began to think, and I was thinking, this, uh, we can just think about this specific to the marriage circle. I began to think what's interesting is that I don't think anyone or any object is an allegory for anything. But it doesn't mean that it's a fixed symbol. Uh, as you were saying, by kind of putting the two in in opposition. I mean, I, th I, I feel in some ways, but again, I, I might change my mind on this, um, that it's not allegorical, that instead, what happens if you think about objects? And, and you are really interestingly saying, it's kind of like, well, there's her scarf, it's her scarf, and then it has this particular life as it you know moves, and then he's, uh, Mueller steps on it as, as Charlotte. But objects throughout this film, and even actions, they're constantly, and that's the notion of the circle. Uh, like there is, uh, there is no way way out or or beyond it. It just keeps circling. So even think of the beginning of the film. Um, you might not have noticed it if you were watching it for the first time. The way that uh, Mitzi and uh, Franz meet is he's coming out of a store. You know, she's she's taken his taxi cab and he's coming out. He's got flowers, so he's going to we assume much later, uh, you know, he's taking those flowers to someone, but they just get kind of uh, lost somewhere along the way because he needs to get out of that taxi cab. And then we get to this to the, the space where he's uh, bringing the, the flowers finally into the house and 
gives them to his wife. She, the next morning, outside, Mueller comes. She, a flower goes down to him. Uh, she comes back up, realizes her husband has dropped the flower she's given him. In other words, these kind of, it's an, one of many objects that pass and pass and pass, or even gestures that just kind of keep repeating and echoing one another in this circle. Right, right. Um, which also links it back to um, the allegorical as the melancholical, like Benjamin describes it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think this is the the really big difference uh, between saying that uh, women as, uh, I don't know, the modern city is, is an allegory. I think this uh -huh. is a symbol uh -huh. because allegory like works in, in another way, which is always not fixed, always have um, like... Uh, ruptures and uh -huh. um, is never complete uh -huh. and I think all the objects are never complete like the example mm -hmm. with the flowers I think it's so good because uh -huh. uh, they they break they get uh, um, quetched uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> in in the yeah. car and then they um, uh, one one gets lost and and, and they are forgotten mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah no it, it's and I, and I see your point exactly and I may need to uh, I I will continue to to kind of think through what 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 would it mean to talk about that as allegory and then a allegory for what I mean the, this life of objects uh, kind of thing but it also then you'd want to think just think about the the marriage circle um, to incorporate that also as well in terms of gesture and the way that Lubitsch is using his camera so remember that scene when uh, 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 Professor uh, Forgetting his name, uh, Brown? Brock. No, Brown. Brock. Brown walks in on Mitzi, and she's called over Braun uh, because she's having trouble with her heart again, and he's kind of messing with her wrist, you know, mm -hmm. wrist, and then uh, we cut in close, and he's changes it to as if he's uh, checking her heartbeat. Well, later when uh, Mueller is coming in to uh, kiss. Charlotte, who thinks that he's her husband, there's a moment where you see that gesture again repeats, but in a different context. It recurs kind of three times through the film, and you begin to notice it, like Lubitsch will single it out, but it's this, it's like an echo uh, that kind of moves through the film. Um, Echoing, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah uh, just maybe just to add, no, to add to that, I think, because I, I, I was thinking um i think your your idea of this as a circle as exchanges that they don't mm -hmm. necessarily lead us out to some greater meaning allegorically if you will um that that to me seems um convincing and i thought perhaps to follow your argumentation that you wanted to sort of offer lubitsch as mm -hmm. as in some sense an alternative if you will to cirque in mm -hmm. in the kind of theorizing and feminist theorizing about cinema it seemed to me so interesting to then think again about the the scarf that blows mm -hmm. um, in Cirque and the scarf that blows in Lubitsch, and they just seem to have completely different, different functions. functions. Um, the scarf that blows in Cirque then becomes what symbolic. Mm -hmm. It stands for mourning or for like um, loss of of um, I, I can't remember and is it in um, all that heaven allows or I, I confuse it with Todd Haynes it's far from heaven where it's over the top uh -huh, but uh -huh. but but whereas here or or in the wreath I think in written on the wind where it goes the toward wind, the, yes. the gate but yeah. in here the scarf um, doesn't seem to me to stand for infidelity it doesn't stand it's like uh -huh. recognize it's just like kitsch on the <laughs> no just like on the <laughs> ground he doesn't even notice it it's toilet yeah. paper stuck yeah. to his foot and then and and then when she sees it it's not like ah oh, this means exactly. something and it's we're anticipating Lubitsch has set it up so that we're anticipating here come they're call she's calling Mitzi Mitzi she's looking for you know her friend and her husband and we think it's the suspense is building that then it will be in it in its and then emptied of right, maybe of it's the it's meaning. the poetics the of kids. It's the poetics of kids, exactly. It, that it's and there's a reason I wore a scarf uh, to perform the poetics. Okay, no, okay. <laughs> okay, no, 
I'm at Urs. Yeah, I have two questions. But first, I want to say, as you uh, just mentioned, suspense. Um, I uh -huh. think that's uh -huh. why Hitchcock loves it so much. Uh -huh. um, yeah. But uh, I have two questions uh, because it's the second movie uh, uh, Lubitsch is shooting in in the US. Mm -hmm. um, we see the the intertitles used in a I think different way as it was used before because it's not explaining the story. It's even the humor is so it's a comical. Mm -hmm. What what he's doing here, uh, Joseph? I need love is <laughs> another uh, great uh -huh, intertitle. Uh -huh. I really liked. Um, was there anything like that before in American silent movies, or was this really a Lubitsch thing? This first question. You know that's a um, that is a great question, and I. Um, I can think of later examples, um, and I can also still hear my students uh, laughing. Our, uh, our classes, our spring quarter ended last week, and uh, I, I showed them part of it with uh, the Clarence Badger film with, with, with Clara Bow, and they just howled, sweet Santa Claus, give me him. Uh, and, but that's 27 and, a, and, a, and has not at all the, the kind of witticism of Lubitsch's um, title cards. When you get to, for instance, that moment where she, his lord, um, uh, called and said, you know, I'm having, I'm having a nervous condition. And so Charlotte insists that her husband go over to her and then she kind of arranges the scene there. And when her, uh, and says, you know, I'm having heart trouble. Uh, and she says to her husband when he arrives, you know, I'm having the heart trouble again. But there it is. That's a play of a different sort because all all throughout, that's everyone laughed, you know, and it was kind of this, this playfulness. But she does have heart trouble, you know, at a kind of figurative level. So that degree of play, kind of play on words that are um, both witty and funny, and yet they point in the other direction. That's that kind of... Um, the shiver, uh, shivering beneath the surface I was talking about at the end, the kind of, um, I'm having heart trouble. Uh, and then as soon as she says it, or even later, uh, to speak of Mitzi's dialogue, when she says uh, to her husband, after Braun has left, after the party, after, you know, and she's, uh, you know, pretended to shoot herself, that she was going to shoot herself. And he comes and she says, Joseph, I need love. And there's that long, it's one of the longest takes in the film, as we are waiting, will her husband forgive her? Does he love her? Does we 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 feel sentimental, a sentimentality for her that quite quickly, uh, not quite quickly, sorry, for that long duration. Then it will again, like the scarf, be overturned. He kind of pats her on the back, um, and we think, oh, she does, you know, she needs love, the, the sentimental. And then we see her; she kicks the gun. She has she moved towards him. In order to distract him, so as soon as, talking about that play with with words, I can't uh, think of any other examples that precede uh, Lubitsch. But um, but I'm always just like his question. Um, I don't know your name, I, but I know we met and we Karen. we will have a wonderful friendship after this. Um, <laughs> but but your question, like, well, what about why why does it begin with marriage circle where it doesn't? You know, it's, it's really hard to pinpoint origins, but using them in the service of making an argument is important. And I'll probably, uh, I'm going to go to do some archival work and I'll probably find something and then I'll send it to you. And, uh, Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> the second we'll question uh, is, is next to that because um, you didn't understand it. Our pianist, who was uh, first time accompanying a, a, an American Lubitsch, told us in German before, um, he, th he thought it's much slower than the German silent movies. Um, that was, mm -hmm. I, w I really was uh, thinking mm -hmm. uh, a lot during our discussion and I would like you to comment on that. Mm -hmm. um, is there any development or even a change in the work of Lubitsch when he gets into the US and does the silent movies over there? If the pianist said it. <laughs> <laughs> it must be true. He, he, yeah, I, 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 the, the people who play uh, like he does, uh, along with the films, I just I admire that immensely and enjoy it. Um, uh, the, the thing is that that Lubitsch is uh, like it would be really different. I mean, if you think of something like the Oyster Princess um, and the doll, they are moving at a rapid pace. They're also 
60 minute or less uh, films or around 60 minutes. And there is a lot going on. Um, and that pace is quick. I mean, that's a kind of comedic pace that is is different. I think the and uh, you were just talking about the incorporation of dialogue. I mean, that would be a part of it. Um, the slowing down of the tempo uh, of the tempo to incorporate uh, this dialogue. But but I wouldn't be willing to say quite the same of something like the loves of Pharaoh, um, or. Um, I don't know, even Gypsy Blood or Carmen, uh, it, it, however you want to, it, it was passed over as, as Gypsy Blood. Um, so it would be hard because of the, of the epics, if we're talking about the comedy, certainly. Um, I'm trying to think of a better, like more accurate answer, but I actually hadn't thought about that in terms of tempo or temporality. Someone else might have, though, someone who's been coming to the series um, all along, and whether or not uh, there was any... Uh, one thing I know is Lubitsch did uh, say when he arrived in the in the States and started working that he just thought the the production capacities that the American film industry was, you know, a super superior that it was above and beyond anything and he said you know one of the problems is that uh, Americans audiences have the mindset of a 12 year old um, and by that he did not mean just they are childlike he meant uh, referring to this kind of puritanical mindset so maybe he slowed things down to introduce this uh, uh, this form of uh, modern mode of representing a yeah infidelity and its playfulness. Yeah. Well, considering how much he valued the childlike, I think that's praise. I know, that's what, as soon as I was saying that, I was like, hmm, I wonder if he did it. You know, child, child, child parties are small. Very, very small people, like at the doll party, but those aren't in the doll, yeah, no. No, Maybe it's, that's it's a, a great good question, though, yeah. yeah. I mean, thinking of it, it goes back to your question. Thinking about the, the relationship between the Berlin productions and, and what happens when he arrives in the U.S., I think there's a lot of continuity, yeah, but differs, too. Jennifer... Yeah, maybe it's a this good has been um, an uh, incredibly the generous bodies. discussion <laughs> at this hour. And it was incredibly generous and, of you to stay. And I think um, the, I mean, the fact that there are so many questions that have, to some extent, remained unanswered is a testament uh, to yeah. the richness and the, I think, productive project that the richness of your project and the productivity of it. Um, so yeah. thank you so much thank for coming. You. Thank Big you. applause, Sharing this with Jennifer us. Bean, to everyone, yeah. and Mark Siegel, of course, who's. Talking to and Urs yeah. of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole film, and the um, Frankfurt. Yes. And uh, yes, All of you for it staying. goes on in two weeks. In zwei Wochen geht's weiter. Laura Horak wird dann hier sein und über Ich möchte kein Mann äh, reden, über Zapatas Bande und den dritten habe ich jetzt vergessen. Lesen Sie es nach, bitte. Das Liebes-ABC, genau. Um, das lohnt sich sehr. Kommen Sie gut nach Hause und bis bald. Tschüss.